together uh, all over. And they let us out. And they let us out of the first time. He'll be uh, coming to me this morning, and he's going to do a special. Um, and then uh, we will, we will uh, finish up uh, before the morning main service starts with a uh, special that both of us will do. So uh, <laughs> if, you have, if you don't have any books, uh, I suggest you get some. If not, then uh, you can put up with us. <laughs> um, it's all here. So as you read the passage, 
past. Growing up, most of us have memorized a lot of these verses. And it just is that gentle reminder that when we got saved, the Lord did some things. And obviously there's a lot of things about justification and sanctification and, and reconciliation and all those different things that took place on salvation. But the fact really comes down to who shall separate us from the love of Christ. When we got saved, there is not anything that we can do or what we could go through that would literally take our salvation from us. Now that is not, again, not a blanket statement that we can just go do anything we want. We understand that we're sinners. We understand that once we got saved, we need to confess our sins. We need to take care of some things so we can maintain fellowship. But one of the things that we forget is, yes, before we were saved, we were sinners. But in all technicalities, once you get saved, you're no longer a sinner. You're a saint. You're bought and paid for by the blood of Jesus Christ. Now, you still have a fallen nature, and we still sin because we have that two natures. But again, we need to just remember that I am a child of God. I cannot lose that. I've been adopted. I've been brought into uh, the uh, um, fellowship of the, of, uh, of the Godhead. And we need to understand that this eternal security is just that. It's eternal. And when we talk about eternal life, how can we have eternal life if it's possible to lose it? Then it would not be eternal. It would be temporal. It's called eternal life. It's called everlasting life for a reason because we have no control over it. So my first thing is over in 1 Peter chapter 1. And a lot of times when we get into 1 Peter, and a lot of folks like to stay away from it because it gets into what people refer to as election. And election is usually one of those teachings that Calvinists hold to. And the idea is, is that God chose this group of people over here to be saved, and he did not choose this group of people over here. Now again, we know that's not true. The Lord has called all sinners to come to repentance. We understand that. So election is just a misunderstanding of a biblical term. But election is also important when we look at eternal security. Because because of election, we have eternal security. Uh, 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 2. 1 Peter chapter 1 verse 2. He says, elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father through sanctification of the Spirit unto obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ, grace be unto you, and peace be multiplied. Now here he's saying that we're elect. We're elect according to something. Well, election in its principles all take place at Calvary. What took place at Calvary made it possible for everyone to accept Jesus Christ. Now someone can either accept Christ or they can reject them. But as the, the doctrine of election comes in, we understand that because of Calvary, we are able to be elect. For instance, if you want to be elected as president in the United States, there are qualifications. And you have to be a natural born citizen. There's different things that you have that are part of it. And I don't know all the details and don't claim to. The fact is, is that there are things that qualify you to be elect. And there are things that would unqualify you to be elect. Well, for the believer, we were qualified to be elect because of Calvary, because of what took place. Look at 1 Timothy chapter 1. Now we're going to we'll bounce all over the place today, so I'll try to go slow, because uh, we're going to look at a lot of different references. But this is just important to understand when we're looking at eternal security, and we start thinking about election, because a lot of times, again, I don't know how it is here, but where I'm at in northern mid-Michigan, Calvinism has just blown up all over the place. And people have gotten good Baptist churches have gotten sucked into Calvinism because they don't know Bible doctrine. Amen. And if we're grounded in Bible doctrine properly, we won't be taken aside with the John MacArthur teaching and all these different things that are out there <coughs> that are pulling these people away. So it's very important as Bible believers to have that understanding. So when we start talking about eternal security, we understand that in order for us to be saved, we have to be elect. We understand that. Well, that election has to do with what took place at Calvary. Meaning, in 1 Timothy chapter 1, and we'll start at verse 14, And the grace of our Lord was exceeding abundant with faith and love, which is in Christ Jesus. This is a faithful saying, and worthy of all acceptation, that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am chief. There is where it all takes place. Election of the believer takes place because Jesus Christ died on the cross. Simple as that. 
Who did Christ die for? Well, according to the passage, he came into the world to save sinners. Well, according to Romans 3, we know, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. So when we start talking about election, who is elect to be saved? Everybody. If you're a sinner, you're elect to be saved. You can choose to accept Jesus Christ, or you can choose not to accept Jesus Christ. But it's up to you. Now, does the Holy Spirit draw? Most certainly. All of us that are here that are saved can give illustrations of how the, how the Holy Ghost drew us and he convicted us and used the Word of God, used testimony, used preaching to deal with us. We, we do not disclaim that the Holy Spirit has anything to do with it. We're just saying that when Christ died on the cross, he paid for everyone's sins and made it possible for all of us to be saved because we're sinners. Now, once you get saved, that opens up a whole new diagram. It opens up an all-new thing. Uh, look at Colossians chapter 2. So election is important. And it's just understanding election. It's not complicated. John Calvin took the, the teaching and he messed it up. And for, uh, you know, what, uh, 500 years now, whatever it's been, it's just been, uh, it just spiraled out of control. And now it's all about higher education. And it has nothing to do with the blood of Christ. To limit what Jesus Christ did on the cross is to limit God and literally say God is a failure. Because he could not save everyone. I mean, think about that. That's a, that's a bold statement to say that God could save this group, but he couldn't save that group. Then what kind of God would do that? Well, not our God. So when we look at it, Colossians chapter 2, in regard to this election, here's what takes place. So when a person gets saved, we know we're sanctified through the Holy Ghost. We know that it's according to the blood of Christ. And when that salvation takes place in Colossians chapter 2, and uh, look at verse 11, it says, And whom also ye are circumcised with the circumcision made without hands, and putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ, buried with him in baptism, wherein ye also are risen with him through the faith of the operation of God, who hath raised him from the dead. So when we get saved, uh, again, that, that, uh, that spiritual operation takes place where the Holy Ghost comes in and he cuts away the body from the soul. Why is that important? Because that is critical to eternal security. When my body sins, I do not sin. Tim Lambert, the new man on the inside, is sinless. He cannot sin. Tim Lambert, the old man on the outside, He's still bound by sin, and when I sin, yes, my flesh sins, but my new man doesn't, because the Lord cut away that soul from the body. And that's important, because how could the Lord indwell us if that didn't take place? And if you could lose your salvation, it really comes down to this. What sin do you have to commit to lose your salvation? Anyone that believes that, they, they always have degrees of sins you have to do until you finally lose your salvation, but... All unrighteousness is sin. Amen. There is not one. Now, I realize in a moral, uh, a mor moral category, some sins are greater than others. But sin is sin. And there are lost people in this world that have never cheated, never lied, never fornicated, never done anything. Don't even use coarse language. Doesn't mean they're not sinners. Now, maybe they haven't committed sins that we might say are more grave. And again, we're not saying that some sins aren't worse than others. We understand that. But what sin is it that's going to make you lose your salvation? Well, because of this, because of this spiritual baptism, again, it has nothing to do with water. This is where we're placed inside the body of Christ. The Lord says, now I've got you sanctified. And when you're sanctified, you're separated. And we don't have to worry about it. Flip back to chapter Colossians 1. In verse 14, great verse. Of course, all the new versions attack it. Colossians 1 14, in whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins. So, when we talk about eternal security, why do we have eternal security? Because in order to be elect, you have to call upon the name of the Lord to be saved, and then the blood is applied. The blood is not applied until you get saved. Now, we understand that the sins are all paid for. Everybody's sins are paid for, past, present, future, but as soon as you call on the Lord, Romans 10, boom, now the blood gets applied, we have the righteousness of Christ. So you have the election of the believer, that's the first reason. 
for eternal security. The second one is in Colossians, same, same chapter, just different verse, verse 27, Colossians 1, 27. And I've already alluded to it a little bit, but the second point of eternal security, and the reason for it is this, is that we are united with Jesus Christ. When you got saved, the Lord made you one with him. We became bone of his bone, flesh of his flesh. We are his body. Again, it was a supernatural event. It's something that we knew nothing of when we got saved, unless you got saved immediately and someone really, you know, began to train you. But when I got saved as a six-year-old boy, I just knew I wasn't going to hell. I didn't learn about all the wonderful things about it until I got older, until I started to read and started to study, and you get into the scripture. Colossians 1, verse 27, it says, To whom God would make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. So eternal security is this. Christ is in me. I am in him. That's the union of the believer. Now, this is a mystery. This isn't something that was made known before Paul. Why is that important? Because in the Old Testament, they didn't have this. They weren't one with Christ yet because there was no body of Christ yet. See how all of these things open up things. You can't be in Christ until Jesus Christ comes and dies on the cross and resurrects and goes on to glory. Then we can be part of the body of Christ. The Old Testament saint knew nothing of eternal security. That's why over in Psalm 51, David is praying to the Lord, take not thy Holy Spirit from me, because he didn't have eternal security. I remember back years ago when, uh, uh, oh, was it Jimmy Schwagger had, again, one of the charismatic preachers who believed you could lose your salvation, but it's when he messed up, all of a sudden he got eternal security down flat. It's amazing how things can change when your position changes. The Bible was always true, but not until he messed up did he realize, oh, you know, I'm still saved. Now, it's not an excuse. Yeah. It's just the point that folks are just not, they're ignorant of things. And sometimes that ignorance is the result of the preacher. It's not always a personal ignorance. It's because the pastor is not teaching his people these things. And we don't give the information because sometimes we have this feeling that, well, I'm going to overload you with information. Well, I would rather be overloaded with information and be able to get a little bit of a bunch than get absolutely nothing from a little bit. Mm -hmm. And the fact is, is that we are saved, and this is a mystery. It's one of seven mysteries that was revealed to Paul, that I am unified with the body of Christ. Look at Ephesians chapter 5. When you got saved, it was a, it was a mystery itself that we could get <laughs> saved. And the fact is, the Lord didn't just save us. He keeps us saved. He makes us part of his spiritual body. Part of the spiritual body. Ephesians 5 and verse 30, he's talking about uh, the husband. He's talking about the wife. But ultimately in the passage, he's talking about the body of Christ and Christ himself. Ephesians 5 verse 30. For we are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother, and shall be joined unto his wife, and they shall be one flesh. This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. The mystery is in regard to the body of Christ and the Lord, not the husband and the wife. The fact of the matter is, is that when you got saved, you became part of his body. And you cannot lose your salvation because if you could, then you would break the body. And the Bible says not a bone of him would be broken. Remember, we won't turn there for the sake of time. But back in John chapter 19, as John is, re is recounting the uh, crucifixion, he says that the, the centurion goes through and they're breaking the legs of each of the, of the thieves and they come to Christ. He was already dead. And then, of course, the fulfillment of the scripture, not a bone of him should be broken. Why is that important? Because doctrinally speaking, the, the body of Christ himself was kept whole because it was a picture of salvation. And we cannot break the body of Christ. Because if the body of Christ is broken, then you have schisms and you have fissures and you have all these issues that go along with it. A couple years ago, I was
was uh, working at my market, and uh, one of my employees, which ended up becoming one of my son-in-laws, uh, was nagging me. He wanted to go home early. It was during deer season. We were super busy. It was just crazy. And he's nagging me, wanting me to go home, and I'm cutting for him. And he's just, I'm, I'm the saw, I'm running the saw, and he's, you know, I, I want to go, and I'm busy, and I'm saying, but we could get busy, and I really need you to be here. And I'm not paying attention, and I take my finger out. About to cut right off, and well, you can see it's crooked. They put it back on, and then I broke it. But anyhow, cut my finger out. And you go in, and this finger is never going to be the same. It's broken, it doesn't work right, it doesn't bend right, I mean, I can't, you can't make the okay sign, you know, it's, it's, it's tragic. The, the point is, is that once it's broken, it's never the same. So if you could lose your salvation, and you could get it back, just like they put my finger back on, it's not the same. It's not perfect. It's not without any, any, any uh, spot or blemish. It's an imperfection. That I will, till, until I die, I will carry the imperfection of a crooked finger. I mean, it's a simplistic thing, but if you could lose your salvation, how would that affect the body of Christ? Now multiply that by however, you know, there's 8 billion people in the world. How many of those people are saved? Let's, let's just say, let's just say currently 10% will say. That's 800 million people saved. And, and how often would you lose your salvation if you could lose your salvation? Me? Once a day. I mean, I get, so I get on the road, and boy, I'll tell you, I lose my patience. I say, well, that's not a big deal. Is that not a sin? Are we not, are we not told to be patient? I mean, are you always expressing loving kindness towards someone? How about forgiveness? What sin is it? We always think it's the big ones, murder and adultery and stealing and drunkenness. or all, We think that's the big ones that do it, but it's the little foxes that spoil the vine. The sins that most of us struggle with are the little things that, in a sense, most people don't see. But bitterness, bitterness is a rough thing. How many people do you know are not in church because they're bitter? And they don't drink and they don't smoke and they don't cuss. And they're good citizens, right? So what sin is it that's going to keep us from, you know, get us to lose our salvation? Fact is, is that not of all the things would be broken. And if we could lose our salvation, we would jeopardize the body. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 12. This is why it's such a pivotal doctrine. 1 Corinthians chapter 12. And we have a problem with forgiveness. 
a lot of people have this idea that how can I be saved if I've done wrong? Well, because doctrinally, the Lord keeps us saved. Look at Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2. You're familiar with this again. Another familiar passage that will just help you get a better understanding of eternal security. Ephesians 2 and verse 8. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. So salvation is a gift. And a gift is anything that is given or bestowed. Anything, whether it's property, whether it's possession, that's transferred from one person to another voluntarily without compensation. We understand a gift means you have to do nothing to receive it. Years ago, we were going, took my kids to Florida, we went, and uh, they had free tickets to Disney World or wherever it was. Well, when I'm thinking free, I'm thinking, oh, this is great, free tickets. But it was a timeshare deal. So in theory, it wasn't free because I had to sit through about a three-hour spiel <laughs> to get those free tickets. Well, if they were free, I should have been able to walk up the to the desk and say, I'd like my two free tickets. They give you the free tickets, and you walk up. That's free. By sitting there and having to listen to it, that wasn't free. Now, again, it was worthwhile because I didn't have to pay for them, but my time is valuable. Every year during Veterans Day, we can find meat market burnt down this year, so we weren't able to do it. But I always give out free steaks to veterans. They come in, and you show your veterans card, and we give you a free steak. Simple as that. You don't have to buy anything. You just got to show that you're a veteran, and we'll do it. That's what free is. When you got saved, the Lord says, I'll give you the free gift of salvation if you'll accept me as your Savior. You come in with your little sinner card. And you say, Lord, I'm a sinner. I want to be saved. The Lord says, you meet the criteria. Here's salvation. So we know what a gift is then. If I was to give you a gift and then to take it from you, it wouldn't be a gift. When we built, uh, my son-in-law and my daughter, they built a new house. And they were doing all kinds of landscaping and stuff. So I had a... Uh, an older Kubota tractor. And it wasn't it wasn't bad shape, but it was older. And I thought, I'm going to give it to them, give it to my daughter and her, her husband so they can use it around the place. So I gave it to them. Now again, you understand, as parents, we give things to our children that does involve the in-laws. Because we never intend to have problems with the in-laws. You know, I mean, yeah, yeah. so I gave the tractor. Well, my son-in-law, we've had some issues this year, and I'll tell you about that in the morning service, but he kind of went off the deep end. He sold the tractor. And I was a little proud at first. And he sold the tractor that I gave him. And then I was, I, mean, I was just proud. I was mad. Because he sold that tractor. I gave that to him, intending that because it's something that you would use literally the rest of your life. Anybody that has a tractor knows this. You will always use a tractor. There is no reason to sell a tractor unless you're getting a bigger one. That's why I got another tractor, because I got a bigger one. Well, he sold it, and I was mad. And the Lord reminded me, well, isn't, wasn't it a gift? Didn't you give it to him? You didn't put any strings on it. I said, here's the keys, here's the tractor, here's the trailer, it's yours. So what are you upset about? And I said, well, because I'm hurt. <laughs> but he said it was a gift. I said, yeah, it was a gift. So get over it. Amen. He gave. Now, here's the thing. When the Lord gave us salvation, he didn't give it to you to do whatever you wanted with it. He kept hold of it. And he says, I am going to give you the gift of eternal life. I am going to keep it. I am going to preserve it for you. And therefore, you can't lose it. Now, if I want to keep my tractor, or my daughter's tractor, so she never left it, I should have kept possession of it. Had them come get it, bring it back when they're done with it, and then say, well, it's a gift. Yeah, but, you know, a gift comes with me controlling it. Say, well, that's not a gift. Well, salvation is. I'm glad the Lord controls it. Aren't you? Yeah. I mean, it's like, it's like leaving an inheritance. Say you have a, a large amount of money, you die. You wouldn't leave an inheritance to a 12-year-old child to willy nilly do what they want with it. Because what would they do with it? They'd squander it. Right. So most people put some criteria on it. Now, here's the thing about this gift. The Bible says that, for by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves it is the gift of God. We often think that the gift is salvation, which it is. But here's the thing you got to remember, too. Faith is a gift. 
The Lord gives you faith. Every one of us that's born into this world, the Lord gave us faith to believe on his son. You can either use that faith to believe on his son, or you can reject that faith. But as the Calvinists will try to teach, well, the Lord has to draw you. Well, he gave everybody that faith. Every human being that comes into this world, the Lord puts it in them to have faith to believe on Jesus Christ. It doesn't matter whether they become an atheist or not. They just rejected that faith. It's no different than as an American. You have the privilege to vote, correct? Every one of us has the privilege to vote. Does everyone vote? No. But they'll complain about things. <laughs> Even when things, we, when you do vote, you complain. We know that. But if you have no room to vote, complain if you don't vote. The point is, is that each and every one of us have received that right. Whether you exercise it or not is up to you. Each and every person that comes into this world is given the gift of faith. And you can either use it to believe on Christ or not. But what is clear is salvation is never based on works. What would you have to do to be saved? And how much would you have to do to stay saved? You ever think about that? How can our works even compare to what Jesus Christ did on the cross? And being a preacher and doing this for now, oh goodness, I, I can't even keep track, 35 years or so, all of the great things that the Lord has allowed me to do could have never saved me. Never in itself would it ever be enough. Because how does it match the righteousness of Christ? So this idea that people have that they're working their way to heaven, no, it's not. It's a gift. I don't know why people don't get that. Especially when you're going into Christmas season, and we all think about how much money are we going to spend on gifts this year? Too much. Too much, exactly. But you know what? It's a gift. And we intend to do that because we love that person or kind of like them in some cases. It just depends. But the point is, is that we love people, we give them things, and whether they reciprocate a true gift never is based on reciprocation. The Lord offers the gift of salvation to everyone, and you just need to receive it. And then once you receive it, then we serve him. But even if you don't serve him, you're still saved. And even if you don't serve him, he'll keep you saved. Now, you won't earn rewards and you won't have the fellowship that you want. But again, salvation is a gift. And look at Titus chapter 1. If the Lord would take away that gift from you, that would make God a liar. And I've learned a lot about, I've learned a lot of things about the Lord over the years. And one thing I know about him is he does not lie. He does not lie. I may not like the things that he says, but when it comes right down to it, if this Bible says it, it's so, and I'm just going to trust that it's so. Titus chapter 1, verse 2. In hope of eternal life, which God that cannot lie promised before the world began. The Bible says the Lord promised eternal life. There it is. Was it, it wasn't manifested until Christ came and died on the cross. It wasn't revealed until Paul shows up and explains these mysteries, right? But it was promised before the world began. And if salvation was of works, and that makes God a liar, because he promised the gift of eternal life. And that's our third point. Look at chapter, uh, 1 John chapter 2. The fourth point about uh, eternal security is this, is we have intercession of Christ for us. So the, the fourth reason for eternal security is, I have the Lord interceding for me. He's the one that is going to speak on my behalf. And I'm glad the Lord speaks on my behalf. Because, again, as you come before the throne of grace, you need Jesus Christ to intercede for you. We don't have Mary. Why would you want Mary to intercede for you? Why would you want a past, as the Catholic Church would call, saint to intercede for you? In my town, the Catholic Church has a sign that says, Welcome, saints and sinners. And I'm thinking that's kind of... A misnomer, that makes sense, because they only believe sa saints are dead people if the Pope says they've met the criteria to be a saint. And I haven't driven by there and seen any dead people rolled in on, you know, except for when they're having funeral days, but you see what I'm saying with that? And again, the idea is, is that people get things wrong, and I don't want a saint interceding for me. Why would you want someone to intercede for you when you have Jesus Christ to do it? First uh, John chapter 2. 1 John chapter 2, verse, uh, verse 1. My little children, these things write unto you, 
that ye sin not. Now we can stop right there. And here John's saying, don't sin. And that's a good charge. I appreciate that. But what does he say after that? And if any man sin. Well, the fact of the matter is, we sin. Now, you know, I'm sure as time progresses and the more you get closer to the Lord, you do sin less. But we still sin. And maybe not as much as we used to. And maybe it becomes fewer and farther between. And maybe you don't do things as big as you used to do. But, you know, at the end of the day, you're still a sinner. Amen. You can't get away from it. Uh, when I was a kid, we had a dog. My, my parents were divorced. My dad had a dog. And I had stepsisters. And, and old Duke, Duke would lay there and just lick and scratch and lick and scratch. And they'd get so mad at Duke and yell at Duke and tell him, quit licking, quit scratching. And I'd get so upset because I'm thinking, it's a dog. Dogs lick and dogs scratch. Amen. I don't care how smart you can tell. You can teach that dog to sit, to roll over, to shake. You can teach it to go to the door, to go outside, to go to the bathroom. You can do all kinds of things, but at the end of the day, it's a dog. <laughs> Some things that dog is going to do because it's its nature. Well, he says, if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. And he goes on to say, he did the propitiation for our sins. And not only ours, but also for the sins of the whole world. Again, against that Calvinism, the Lord paid for the sins of everyone, anyone that will come to him to be saved. But here's the fact. We have an intercessor. Jesus Christ intercedes for us. He's an advocate. He is a lawyer. He is the one that stands between <coughs> us and God and intercedes when the devil comes and makes the railing accusations against us. When we pray, we pray in Jesus' name. Why? Because we're praying in the Spirit, through the Son, to the Father, the God that is involved in all of it. And that's the intercession work. Aren't you glad that you can talk to the Lord about your problems? Aren't you glad you can pray? And, and the Lord knows that, you know what, you're going to sin. He knows that there's going to be things that take place. But thank God that that fellowship can still be maintained. Look at 1 John, same book, first chapter. Look at verse 7. The Lord wants to maintain fellowship with us. That's one of the great things about eternal security. I can keep my fellowship with the Lord. First John chapter 1, verse 7, but if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another. And the blood of Jesus Christ is son cleanses us from all sin. Here's one of the things about eternal security. When I got saved, the Lord keeps me saved. If I want to have fellowship with him, I have to walk in the light. If I walk in darkness, it does not mean I'm no longer saved. It just means I don't have fellowship, right? It's like people that come to church. People that come to church, you fellowship with them. If they're not church, you can't fellowship with them. Not that you don't want to, but when you come to this place, it's a place of fellowship. It's a place where we get to talk and visit and spend time with each other. And it's not that we don't want anyone else to come in. We want everyone to come and visit with us. But you've got to come from out there to come in here to do it. Now, that you have members that are members of this church that may not be here today. That doesn't mean that they're not saved because they're not in this place. It just means they're not here today. And because they're not here, you can't fellowship with them. Well, if you're saved and you choose not to walk in the light, it doesn't mean you're not God's child. It just means you're not going to get the fellowship. Verse, uh, verse 9, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Notice that there's not one sin the blood of Christ can't cleanse. One, all unrighteousness. So when we got saved, we have an intercessor that is able to save us. And then after we're saved, what we do is we go to the Lord and we confess our sins, not to stay saved, but to maintain fellowship. So that way we can continue to stay close. And again, it's just that reminder that the blood of Jesus Christ cleanseth us from all sin. All sin. Not some sin, all sin. I'll give you this last verse, and I'm going to have to wrap it up. Look at Hebrews 7. When Jesus Christ died on the cross for you and I, he died on the cross for you and I to save us to the uttermost. Salvation is a serious topic. There's people out there that says, well, God can't save me because of this, that, or the other. You know what that says? If you think God can't save you, that means God failed. That means God, in his infinite wisdom, didn't know that you were going to do such heinous acts, and he wouldn't have prepared for it. Well, the fact of the 
Andrews and Lord knew everything that Ted Bundy did before Ted Bundy did it and even after Ted Bundy did it. And supposedly Ted Bundy got saved, I pray he did. That doesn't change the terrible, heinous things he did, but it'd be a terrible thing to be a wicked, horrible person like that and end up in hell. Does he deserve it? Most certainly. But so did I. The Lord knew, you look at these guys that are just terrible serial killers and people like Adolf Hitler or whoever you look at that have done terrible things against humanity, they still need to be saved and they still can be saved. Because look at Hebrews chapter 7 and I'll close with this verse. He says, wherefore he is able to save them <coughs> to the uttermost Amen. that come unto God by him, see he ever liveth to make intercession for them. He saves to the uttermost. That means there is not one thing the Lord cannot save us from. And that's why eternal security is so important. Because we have an intercessor with Jesus Christ that intercedes for us because of what he did on the cross. At the end of the day, eternal security all comes back down to the fact that it's bought and paid for through the blood of Jesus Christ, finished at Calvary. And you couldn't lose it if you, if you could. Now you can, which is a blessing. But if you could, you couldn't. <laughs> These folks have got this idea that you lose your salvation. They just haven't studied it. They just want to repeat the mantra, once saved, always saved, and that can't be possible because how could God forgive a person for this, that, and the other? Well, just because you couldn't forgive someone Amen. doesn't mean God can. That's right. And that's why we're to be more like Christ 